Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the beginning of a day-long colloquium. It has the title of The Virtues of a Liberal Education, which I think speaks to what we're about at Brown. I think most of you know that liberal education of the type we offer has been taking some heat in recent years. And you know, the questions that we get are, shouldn't we be focusing just on technical skills to the exclusion of social sciences and the humanities? How can it be that studying philosophy or art or classics or anthropology can actually help people make a difference to society? And, you know, I believe, ironically, somewhat ironically, the liberal arts are under siege at a time when the world is most in need of their benefits. Uh, I think all of us know, and I'm probably speaking to the converted, that a strong liberal arts education gives us the critical thinking skills, the translational abilities, the cultural competencies, and a long list of other talents and abilities that are essential for life in the 21st century. Brown has an ecosystem that is especially well suited to co cultivating thinkers who can really make a difference to society. Uh, I love our culture of free inquiry, our curriculum that cultivates intellectual entrepreneurship, and a community that's known for collaboration across departments and close faculty-student interactions. Throughout Brown, faculty and students are using the wide-angle lens of the liberal arts to consider and address very important and complex questions in environmental sustainability, politics, population health, and many other areas of inquiry. Now, the point of the panels in the keynote address today is not to mount a defense of the liberal arts and liberal education. It's really, I think, in a way to demonstrate why they're essential. We've pulled together panels of thoughtful, remarkably distinguished people who are making a difference in their communities in the world. They are all members of the Brown community, alumni, faculty, and at least one Brown parent who we adopt as our own. Uh, today's conversation will offer insights on four compelling topics. Uh, first, bridging the great divide, politics, polarization, and progress in 21st century America. That's the panel we're starting today with uh, four very distinguished governors. We'll turn then to social justice, social change, the role of the documentary, which will feature three alumni, two filmmakers and a journalist, and lively conversation. Uh, one panel on uh, technology and its impact on liberal uh, education. And then finally, one on disagreement and dissent, the role of revolution in shaping our world. Uh, in between, we'll have a distinguished keynote from Tom Perez, Brown alum, who is uh, currently the, heading the Department of um, Labor. So, you know, each of these conversations represents the kind of open dialogue and cross-cutting approach that's so essential to Brown. Uh, on behalf of the university, I want to thank all of our colloquium participants for sharing their wisdom, their expertise, and their time with us. I also want to take a moment to thank the faculty, the staff, and the students who've taken a, a, a lot of time and a lot of energy into imagining and shaping the events of this weekend. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator of the first panel, Wendy Schiller. She's an associate professor of political science. Uh, she brings to the discussion the perspectives of a scholar, a practitioner, and a pundit. She is one of our most popular professors in the political science department and a frequent commentator and analyst on a wide range of public policy issues. So I want to welcome Wendy and our panelists, and uh, you can take it from here. Thank you. Good morning. Is my mic mic on? I don't usually use the podium for a fairly obvious reason. <laughs> I, and I, I teach in this room, so I'm used to really going back and forth. So I, without further ado, though, I want to um, introduce the stars of our morning. And it's terrific to start out the morning with such distinguished and accomplished people. Um, we have a, a unique opportunity in a very short period of time to learn a lot about governance at the state level, but also party politics at the state level, and most importantly, the national level. So in order not of alphabetical or any other reason except that we live in Rhode Island, um, uh, I would ask all four governors to come up um, and sit down, and then I'll uh, introduce you. Can we just sit there? Yeah. 
So I, I, don't, I don't think the first panelist needs a lot of introduction in this audience, Governor Lincoln Chafee. Um, I've been told to say that you went to Brown, but not the year of your graduation. That's, okay. That's what I've been instructed. <laughs> um, we have Governor Maggie Hassan, who is a graduate of Brown and also a parent of a Brown student, a governor of New Hampshire, um, recently elected. We have Governor Jack Markell of Delaware, um, also, I'm not going to reveal when you graduated, uh, uh, on his second term in Delaware. And Peter Shumlin, who's the proud parent of a Brown student, governor of Vermont. So welcome again. <laughs> so rather than spend time talking about them, I'm going to let them speak about them. So the first question is, uh, you've all run, you've all won elected office, some of you more than uh, once, and you're in your second term. Could you tell us a little bit about your view of the partisan landscape in your own states when you ran and how it's changed since then? And then if you could comment on the partisan landscape in the nation, either between the Republicans and Democrats or even within the Democratic and within the Republican parties, I think that would really be fascinating. And because we are in Rhode Island, we are starting with our esteemed governor, Lincoln Chafee. Well, thank you, Professor Schiller. It's great to join the Brown community and celebrate your 250th birthday. I do remember the 200th birthday, 1964, and uh, President Johnson came. Uh, he was in a re-election re that year, 1964. And 1964 also is a very important year in the subject we're talking about, the partisan divide, because as you remember, uh, Barry Goldwater was nominated uh, for, as a Republican candidate, and my dad was governor at the time, and he had a small speaking role at the convention out in the Cow Palace in San Francisco. He took my brother and I to that convention in 1964, so I was 11 years old then, and uh, the, the moderate Republican, the Eisenhower wing of the party, really didn't, wasn't very organized. Uh, governor Rockefeller just had a divorce, and that was a big issue at the time. Governor Scranton had just been elected governor of Pennsylvania, so he really didn't want to uh, be the president. And so the Goldwater forces really uh, controlled the convention and nominated uh, Barry Goldwater. But the important thing that happened is that in the election of 1964 against Lyndon Johnson, if you can believe it, Barry Goldwater won only six states. His home state of Arizona and Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina. And he was the party of Lincoln. The Republicans were the party of Lincoln. I don't think there was a dog catcher elected Republican in any of those states. <laughs> but he had voted against the Civil Rights Act as a libertarian of some reason. And for that reason, those southern states, Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, voted for Republican. And that's, where, that's when things start to change in the Republican Party. Nixon in 1968 developed his Southern strategy, uh, going after Rizzo Democrats, and, and it started to change. And now we see it's very different from uh, when Lyndon Johnson was here in 1964, when there are a lot of conservative Democrats in the South, uh, liberal Democrats across the Northeast. It was a mix. And now you just see pure red states, all Republican in the South, the Mountain states, and then the blue states. And that's what's brought us to this divide uh, that we're trying to bridge uh, today. And not good for our country, as we all know. Uh, and I know that we'll share some of the thoughts, gerrymandering of districts, but I do remember 1964. One last story before I, uh, being at that convention, uh, when Nelson Rockefeller got up to give his concession speech, the boos rained down from the Cow Palace. They wouldn't stop. The, I saw this fervency. It's kind of the Tea Party Back there in 1964, this fervency, they booed and booed Nelson Rockefeller. Finally, he'd step away from the lectern and the boo boos would subside, and then he'd come up to uh, the microphone, they'd, they'd rise again, and uh, finally he turned to the MC and said, you quiet him down. You could hear it over the microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You quiet him down. So yeah, that's the same Tea Party fervency uh, that uh, doesn't care sometimes about winning the general election. It's more about ideological purity. Well, thank you, Lincoln, for, for that observation. Um, I live in a truly purple state at this point. I am a Democratic governor uh, with a small New Hampshire State Senate that numbers 24 that is controlled by a majority of 13 to 11 Republicans. Um, we have a 400-person House of Representatives in New Hampshire, 
for 1.3 million people. And that <laughs> has got, uh, we are about the third largest legislative body in the modern uh, system uh, globally. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we uh, and that's controlled by Democrats right now. I've been involved in elective office since I was first elected to the New Hampshire State Senate in 2004. And during that time, uh, in 2004, uh, we ousted a very conservative Republican governor in New Hampshire, brought in a Democratic governor, um, and at that time, Republicans held both chambers. 2006, 2008, with the wave of anti-war and anti-George uh, Bush feeling um, in New Hampshire, uh, Democrats controlled both chambers and the governor's office for the first time since the Civil War. In 2010, uh, when I think really the Democratic Party platform in a midterm election was it could have been worse, uh, which was true, um, but not really very compelling. Um, and and I, I say that, I mean, it, it's funny, but it's not. I mean, it, you know, we were dealing with trying to deal with the impact of the worst recession since the Great Depression, and, um, and people were hurting, and we felt it at the polls. Um, <coughs> In New Hampshire, that the result of that swing was that while the Democratic governor, John Lynch, kept his office, and we run for office in New Hampshire every two years for everything, um, while he kept his office, we swept in Tea Party majorities in both chambers, and they held over two-thirds majorities in both chambers, which for those of you who study politics know is a very, very powerful number to have. Um, what then happened was really interesting because the Tea Party that so dominated our legislature uh, not only did things like cut our university system budget by half while cutting the cigarette tax, uh, giving a lot of us the ability to say the Tea Party believes young people should go to college less and smoke more. Um, and, uh, but they also went after, they, they conducted the legislative process in a way that was really antithetical to how New Hampshire has always prided itself in a truly transparent volunteer citizen legislature. I should add our representatives all get paid $100 a year um, and uh, that won't change because it's set in our constitution from the late 1880s. Um, and so it is a true volunteer legislature. And uh, the behavior of the Tea Party doing things like locking the public out of the gallery of the chamber during budget debate uh, really bothered our people across party lines. So in 2012, um, I was elected governor and we now have this split legislature. Um, and we have, over the last year, um, passed the most bipartisan budget in over a decade. Uh, it passed unanimously out of our Republican Senate and almost unanimously out of our Democratic House. Uh, just this week, we announced a bipartisan, uh, well, the Senate passed a bipartisan health care expansion uh, some people might call it Medicaid expansion, um, out of the New Hampshire Senate. Um, and we have a bipartisan bill to fund our highway system moving forward as well. Uh, what I think it speaks to is that most people in their daily lives, in our towns, in our communities, in our states, and in our country, solve problems all the time. They do it in their families and in their businesses and in their communities. In New Hampshire, and I'm sure in the other states represented here, they do it in volunteer work. Um, they do it everywhere, and they do it without regard uh, of political difference or party affiliation. That's what they expect from their elected leaders. And one of the benefits of being in a state with extraordinary grassroots uh, democracy and civic engagement is that the people of our state are very clear that that's what they want us to do. And when they threw the Tea Party out of office in 2012, I think the message was very clear to elected leaders was to attend to the challenges we face in our state. Um, and they are significant, but they are solvable. Um, and to really not let partisan politics divide us. And in contrast to what you see in DC right now, I am amazed at how many people in my state, um, outside of the state's capital, know that that budget was a unanimous vote out of a Republican Senate and out of a Democratic House. They know that we've done things in a bipartisan way and they care about it enormously. Um, and so that's, it's been a very wonderful and helpful thing um, as a first year governor to have the people of my state so clear and so supportive of true problem solving. Thank you very much, Governor.
Governor Markell? So I'm from the uh, state of Delaware, and I very much agree with uh, what Governor Hassan just had to say. Uh, I was first elected uh, to statewide office in 1998 when I ran for state treasurer. And at that time, I'm, I'm a Democrat, uh, as we all are here. Uh, the Democrats had an eight-point edge in registration. Uh, today, we have a 20-point edge, and it's not really been that long. When I ran in 1998, Democrats controlled three out of the nine uh, statewide seats. Uh, today, we control eight out of the nine. And there's a good chance that a year from now, we'll control a nine out of the nine. And so we have seen a pretty significant shift. But I do believe that much of that shift is really attributable to what Governor Hassan was just saying, which is that the people see us as problem solvers. People at this state level, and I think this is a critically important difference between what happens in Washington and what happens in most states, people really don't care that much about partisan politics at a statewide level. None of us is measured based on whether we give a great speech or whether our rhetoric is particularly good. We're measured on things like whether we're putting people back to work, whether we're improving schools, and whether we're good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And I think you could make a pretty good argument that that's not really what the folks in Washington, for the most part, uh, are, that's not what really drives them. I mean, so much of it is about scoring points against the other party. So much of the political strategy is how do we stop the other party so that we can have a gain in the next election. And the voters don't have any patience for that, at least not at the state level, because the kinds of things that we're working on around schools and around jobs and good roads and whether we have a, a nice environment and a good quality of life, those are not Democratic or Republican issues. So each of the last um, several elections, I was elected governor for the first time in 2008 and then re-elected in 2012. And when I was elected in 2008, it was the first time in decades that, de that Democrats took control of the state house. And I sat down that night with the Speaker of the House, the brand new Speaker of the House, who had been the minority leader for like 20 years. And I said to him that we're in an incredibly strong position, but we can't overinterpret what we think this election means. What the voters expect of us is that we're going to solve problems. And I believe that what voters are looking for and the people who serve them is they want people who have a sense. I think one of the most important jobs any of us has is to have a clear sense of the way the world around us is changing, to have a perspective about what those changes mean for life in our state and for our citizens, and to have a vision for how we ought to do things differently, to have a real game plan for how we make that vision real, and then they have to know that we're gonna to fight to make that vision real. And if we make that happen, we'll be successful. So in 2010, when uh, the Democrats were getting crushed across the country, we actually picked up a couple of seats again in our state house, in our state senate. And I had the same conversation again with the speaker and with the president pro tem. And it's a conversation now that I'm having pretty frequently. And essentially the message is, I'm willing to be the adult in the room, but it's a whole lot better if we do that all together. And so far for us, it's worked uh, pretty well. But again, I think the key thing, and I think what Governor Hassan was really focused on, the people expect us to be problem solvers. And they expect us to be problem solvers before we're partisans. And if that's what we focus on, we'll be successful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Governor Shumlin. Well, thank you so much. And I'm honored to be here at Brown. It's, uh, re it's been very therapeutic for me, actually, so far. And I should probably tell you why. Uh, as public servants and governors, we're not supposed to talk much about our failures but I am the only person on this panel that got rejected from Brown. <laughs> so I came down here to get even. <laughs> but he got into and, Wesleyan, which well, is where my dad taught. So that's there you true. Go. <laughs> but I am a tuition payer, and I'm honored to be here. <laughs> and it's been very therapeutic so far when I asked uh, Governor Chafee on the way ever, so I've always tried to figure out why, you know. And I said, what did you write in your essay? He said, well, you know, I said that I was going to go to the United States Senate, get some things done there, then I was going to be governor of Rhode Island, and they ought to take me. <laughs> <laughs> so then I asked Governor Hassan how she did it, and she said, well, I said I was going to be the second woman governor from New Hampshire, get some tough things done there, and they ought to take me. <laughs> then I asked Governor Markell, and you can imagine what he said, I want to be the governor of Delaware, I'm going to grow jobs economically, they ought to take me. So. I understand what I didn't say. <laughs> um, there's not much I can add to the 
to the brilliance of these Brad grads when it comes to partnership, Vermont's an interesting state. We actually, people think of Vermont as being a progressive, uh, democratic-leaning state, which is true. We have the best congressional delegation, I think, in America, in Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Welch. Uh, but actually, when it comes to governors, folks use a different standard when they measure governors for lots of reasons. We manage budgets, have to make financial decisions. So Vermont has changed governors Democrat, Republican, every single time that we've switched governors since 1963. So I followed eight years of a Republican governor. Uh, one of the beauties of Vermont is that uh, our Republicans don't drink too much tea. Uh, <laughs> we're the co Green Mountain Coffee Roaster State, if you were wondering. <laughs> and uh, for that reason, we actually have Republicans that, frankly, Link Chafee used to be, Republicans you could be proud of, uh, you know, fiscally thoughtful and cautious, but socially open-minded. And of course, that's what escaped the country. I think the only thing I can add to the partisan question right now as we look at America, and many of us, regardless of party, are baffled by the extraordinary partnership that is, without a doubt, crippling the greatest democracy in the world, in Washington, D.C. And so the question for us is, well, you know, what's going on in the states? And why is partisanship not crippling state government? And it really isn't, at least in Vermont. And I think that's what we need to look to right now as our salvation for our democracy. If you look at what, you know, Governor uh, Hassan and Governor Chafee and Governor Markell and other governors are doing in their states, we're actually solving the problems that they should be solving in Washington. So I would say, historically, right now, there's never been a more important time to be a governor, and there's never been a higher responsibility to lead while you're there and get tough things done. And when I think about the partisanship equation, how that enters into it, I've never found, whether being in a state senator or a governor, that I've gotten really tough things done without some Republican support. Because when you're moving the needle on the issues that we must move on and that Washington is failing on right now, uh, if you do it alone, generally you won't get the buy-in of enough folks to make a difference. Now, I'll give you some examples. Uh, Twelve years ago, when I was president of the Senate, Vermont passed and invented civil unions. I mean, you know, Al Gore said sometime that he invented the Internet. We actually invented civil union. And uh, every governor up here, you know, has since then adopted either civil unions or marriage equality in their states. Now, when we did that, frankly, Vermonters thought we were crazy. Uh, the nation thought we were crazy. Let's be honest about this. You know, Vermont just passed something like marriage. You know, you can get married up there just because you love somebody and want to declare that love for the rest of your life. I mean, they thought we were nuts. And uh, my point is, we did it with Republican support. And we couldn't have passed it without Republican support. So then what happens? Well, then a few years later, we decided we'd be the first state in the nation to pass marriage equality just because it was the right thing to do, not because judges were telling us to do it. Now, just, and again, folks thought we were a little nutty. Now, just four weeks ago, the 17th state in America adopted marriage equality without any fanfare without any marching in the streets, without folks coming out and saying, you know, what's wrong with these people? So my point is, the states are the laboratories for change, and when it's big change, if you don't get bipartisan buy-in, it's going to make the road a lot rougher. So what else are we doing? You know, we've got to be addressing the most important challenge that we're facing, which is climate change. Let's get right down to it. You know, if we don't get this one right really fast, really soon, we're out of time. So we governors are doing it. I would argue Washington is not. You know, we're building renewables like that. I know we've doubled the number of solar panels in Vermont since I've been governor in the last three years. We're putting up wind. We're harnessing the sun and the wind in our fields and our forests and everything we know how to do to an energy efficiency right. You know, we get, and guess what? We're creating jobs because of it. Education. I now have the privilege of having the fifth lowest unemployment rate in America. I did not have that when I was elected. I got the lowest unemployment rate this side of the Mississippi. But when I go out and talk to my employers, they're saying, give us more people trained to do the jobs in the 21st century because we can't keep growing. So from early child education to higher education to workforce retraining, governors are getting education right. We know that's the key to job growth and prosperity. And finally, health care. 
listen, you know, the states are the laboratories for change for real health care reform. And health care reform is a lot more than the Affordable Care Act. We governors can tell you that. Great start for lots of reasons. It will help out a little bit. But what does it not do? It doesn't contain cost. Full now, stop. I'm going to stop you right there because you've raised exactly what the next question right. would be. So we are going to open this up for questions, but I want to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, because that's exactly what I think the audience wants to hear about, and then we'll open it up to wider questions. So if each governor could comment, A, on uh, the Affordable Care Act and your experience as governor, either originally working with the Obama administration and now implementing it, and what you think the pros and cons are, and your each experience making it happen. And I think we'd love to learn about that from each of you. Just about 30 seconds each. No, no. I mean, <laughs> no. Well, at least maybe, two minutes. <laughs> so anything was better than the status quo, and we just saw health costs going up. As mayor, we had to supply, when as mayor of my city, we had our Blue Cross contract, and I remember uh, trying to control our property taxes and seeing that Blue Cross uh, uh, premiums come in higher and higher, 12% one year, 15% another year. There just had to be a better way. And for all the critics of the Affordable Care Act, uh, Give us an alternative is what the what we've been saying, and so far it's going well in Rhode Island. Very uh, well. We're, yeah. we're getting it implemented. My dad, of course, was involved back in the early '90s trying to do it nationally, and uh, it came back under President Obama. And it, it, every civilized country has some kind of universal health care. It's time we we did the same. Sure, there's going to be glitches. I think someone said your first iPhone didn't work right away either. So uh, <laughs> we'll we'll iron out the glitches, and th this is going to work eventually. Thank you. Well, I was really um, frustrated with the rollout of the Affordable Care Act and thought it was unacceptable. Having said that, it has been improving. And uh, in my state, uh, it's been incredibly important for the people who haven't had access to insurance before. Um, and to know that people who have pre-existing conditions uh, are going to be able to get care, to know that there's no more uh, lifetime caps on insurance, that young people can stay on their parents' health care, uh, something we did in New Hampshire as a as, uh, product of state law uh, a few years ago, but people on self-insurance policies it didn't apply to, so it's been very important to have it in the Affordable Care Act. Um, you can keep going through the advantages of the Affordable Care Act, and there are some long-term incentives for um, changing the reimbursement system, so we hope with cost containment. Um, in New Hampshire, part of the byproduct of having Tea Party uh, rule from 2010 to 2012 was we actually were prohibited by law from having the state accept any federal money to implement the Affordable Care Act. So we have been playing catch up pretty much uh, since I became governor. We still can't accept federal dollars uh, to help us with our partnership exchange. We were also banned from setting up a statewide exchange, but we have uh, found ways that private entities can accept that money and partner with the state. So right now uh, we are on track to uh, meet our goal for enrolling 17,000 uh, Granite Staters on our partnership exchange by the end of March. I think the last number I saw was 16,800, so we're getting right there. And the enrollment process is going well. And just on Thursday, our state senate uh, passed a form of Medicaid expansion, uh, healthcare expansion, which will allow uh, those newly eligible on Medicaid uh, to uh, go on to Medicaid for the next year while we set up a private premium assistance plan, similar to what Arkansas and Iowa are likely to do. We'll need to get federal waivers to do that. But in a state that uh, has been hampered a little bit by having um, only one insurance carrier on our current exchange, so we have a competition issue uh, that's pr a problem for us. Uh, the fact that we're going to be moving this new population onto private insurance, I think, will help us provide more competition uh, for all Granite Staters. The other great thing about the Affordable Care Act that is uh, something we don't talk enough about is that it, for the first time, provides substance abuse and mental health benefits. And in my state, these are huge challenges. And to know that we are going to have coverage for substance abuse and mental health, especially with the co-occurring population, is a huge, huge benefit. And it is one understood by every family, every neighbor in New Hampshire, because these are real um, compelling problems in our states, and people know it.
you wouldn't know it from the media, but the most important developments in the country around health care have nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act, or have little to do with the Affordable Care Act. The most important work going on in the country is the work that's going on in our states uh, to move away from, frankly, what is not really a health care system. Yeah. It's a sick care system, and moving toward a health care system. And more, more to the point, there's no industry, there's no other industry, where I, I'm guessing if I asked most of you, you probably have health insurance, and if, you were rec if your doctor recommended that you have an MRI or CAT scan, you'd probably get one. And you probably have no idea what it costs. And that's, I mean, there's no other industry in the world where you can, there's, no, there's so much of a disconnect between what you feel in your own wallet and the value of the service you get. And so it's no wonder that I'm sure if you look at all of our budgets, our health care budgets have been skyrocketing, squeezing the, all the other investments that we want to make. And so, and I know I have friends in, in this room who are doctors, and I, so hopefully you take this the right way, but in a, we, it's just not sustainable. The, the, the current model of how healthcare is delivered and paid, for, and paid for is not sustainable. Because the idea that providers get paid more when they do more procedures, or that hospitals get paid more when they're filling up beds, that has nothing to do with whether or not they're keeping people well. So I don't underestimate the difficulty in making this change. In fact, I think it is by far the most complicated public policy challenge we face. Education's complicated, transportation's complicated, the environment's complicated. Nothing comes close to healthcare because you're talking about changing the way an entire industry gets paid. But there is very exciting work going on in states across the country. Uh, Oregon and Arkansas have really taken a lead. We, for the last year in Delaware, have had stakeholders around the table. And you're seeing some good work. I mean, in Delaware, for example, our leading hospital system had so many people coming in to use the emergency room on such a frequent basis who didn't need to use the emergency room. But when people don't have access to coverage, they get sick and they don't go see a doctor and they get sicker and they get sicker still. And finally, they end up in the most expensive place of all, the emergency room. And so in this case, our hospitals are actually now paying home visits to these people. They know who they are and sort of intervening earlier to try to make sure that they're doing the right thing for their health. And if they have to see a healthcare professional, that they're diverting them before they get to the emergency room and they're diverting them to a place that's more effective and more uh, cost efficient as well. And so this is going to take some time uh, to make this change into what, but if, when you have a fee for service model and third party pay, you've got the foundation of absolutely unsustainability. And that's what we have. And we have an incredible imperative to change it because if you look at where the public dollars are going, one of our former colleagues, the governor of Montana, Brian Schweitzer, likes to say that states do three things. We educate, we medicate, and we incarcerate. <laughs> and if you look at our budgets, that's about right. But if you, and if you look over the last 10, 20, 30 years, the portion that's represented by health care has continued to go up and up, and it's just not sustainable. And so making this change real, moving away from fee-for-service, very difficult, but absolutely important. Governor Sumlin? I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you one minute to elaborate on what you were saying earlier. You know, I think they said know. it all. The only thing I'll add uh, is uh, we're, the math matters here. And so when you know, Governor Markell talks about moving fee-for-service to outcomes-based payments, which is what we have our entire state of Vermont trying to do right now, uh, this is how the math works in Vermont, just to, make, to illustrate the point. And frankly, I think the, the shortcoming of the Affordable Care Act has a lot of benefits, but the shortcoming. Right now, Vermonters spend 20 cents every dollar they make on health care. 20 cents. We're not that different than the other 49 states. If health care costs were to grow for the next 10 years at the same rate that they did for the last 10 years, that number doubles. So, you know, you all can do the math, but if you're trying to create jobs, trying to grow prosperity, trying to get more income into families' pockets, uh, I think we all know that that's a prescription for economic disaster, not only for Vermont, but for America. So we've got to move, as Jack just said, from fee-for-service to outcomes-based payments, <coughs> find better ways to deliver quality for less money. That's where the rubber hits the road, and that's the shortcoming of the Affordable Care Act. Thank you so much. <laughs> this reminds me of class. I'm always running late. So um, if you would like to come up and ask questions, we'd love to hear them. There are two mics on, on both sides, if anybody wants to be the first uh, person, come on up and you can ask a question. In the meantime, while you're getting to the mic, we wanted to say that we did invite Governor Bobby Jindal, who's governor of Louisiana, um, of the Republican Party and a, a alumna of Brown, 
Unfortunately, Governor Jindal could not make this panel, but we want to make sure that we try to include as many perspectives as we could, and we're super, super pleased with the people that did show up. So thank you again very much for coming. Your question. Thank you. Governors, thank you so much for coming. We really much appreciate that. Uh, but actually, Professor Schiller mentioned exactly what I wanted to ask. Uh, there are other states where bipartisanship has not been so successful. In fact, uh, in the national news, great controversies. Wisconsin, for example, Ohio, and uh, my home state of New Jersey, uh, where there have been substantial conflicts. Uh, would you have any advice or suggestions to those of us who live in these other states on how we might help bridge the gap between partisanship and bring the successes that you have brought to your states? Well, for, I mean, first of all, there's nothing wrong with conflict. Yeah. I mean, I think conflict is actually a good thing. I mean, I think we get better. And if the conflict is around ideas, as, around, as opposed to personality, that's fine. Because and, you know, there's, you know, there's progress in us working together and taking ideas. None of us has a monopoly on good ideas. And I, I say the same thing to folks in my state uh, all the time. But I think in the end, the voters, you know, the, we all react to what, to what the people who vote for us uh, think. And, they and I'm pretty sure that people in New Jersey, Wisconsin, Ohio, and all these other places uh, expect us to be problem solvers. And the more that you can remind the elected officials that that's what you expected them, I think over the long term, that's what you're going to get. Yeah, I, I guess I'd add um, a, a couple of thoughts. One is, Jack's actually absolutely right. Um, it's not whether you argue or debate. You will, um, partly because it's really essential to democracy and to developing great ideas, um, partly uh, because we're human and that's what we do. Uh, but it's what you do after you argue that really matters. And uh, you know, we're trying to build a stronger, more innovative state. Uh, we, we all want to lead in developing the best innovative uh, economy in the country. We want to strengthen our middle class. We want to be responsive to businesses. We want to develop that workforce pipeline. Um, we want to protect our taxpayers. So to do all of that requires a dedication to exchanging ideas, having debates, but then coming back to the table after you argue and find your way through. Um, a, a guidepost I'm using these days is Robert Frost's quote, which is, the best way out is always through. And it's a good reminder that you can't just throw up your hands and walk away because you're having disagreements. So, um, but I do think there's real value to voters reminding governors and elected leaders of that fact, but also engaging at a level where they can help understand the value of the compromise that elected leaders may have reached. Because I think the hardest challenge in today's democracy is distinguishing the loud from the many. And when you get formula emails, you know, when an advocacy group emails its membership and says, please email your senator or your governor and tell them to stop whatever. I used to get on the phone as a state senator to some of the people if they shared their phone number with me in those emails and say, but we got this compromise going. And I think the part of the bill that, you know, whatever club is objecting to uh, is now been addressed. And here, I don't care, Senator, they told me you have to vote against it. So it does start with people, and it does start with voters. And you all have to find a way, we all have to find a way to understand the issues and the dialogue at a level where we can truly compromise and where voters support that compromise. They do when they understand the policy, um, but it is these issue groups that um, sometimes drive the division that is also a challenge for us. I just want to add to the, I mean, you mentioned the specific states of New Jersey, uh, Wisconsin, and Ohio. And you know, there's something in Wisconsin and Ohio that I think is reflective of a difference between governors. Now, New Jersey, I mean, generally, we find as governors, you're better off moving traffic than blocking traffic. <laughs> but yeah, you couldn't resist, could you? But in, it works. But in, uh, in Ohio and in Wisconsin, you know, it's important to remember that in 2010, uh, when a number of us were elected here, it was the biggest class of new governors in the history of America. The biggest class. 36 new governors. It was the same electorate that sent the Tea Party folks to Congress. Let's not forget that. So in the cases of Wisconsin and Ohio, as an example, Governor Kasich and, and, and Walker, 
they're actually implementing the policies philosophically that the Tea Party folks in Congress also ran on. The difference is they can't actually do it, but the governors can. I mean, let's be candid about this. So what have they done? And this has been true with Scott in Florida. I can walk you through the list. Even our little friend LePage up in Maine, right, right here in Northeast. What they did was uniformly reduced taxes on the wealthiest and paid for that in every case with extremely deep cuts to a public education. Then they pitted voters against working Americans, labor, teachers, snowplow drivers, and the rest to justify, frankly, a class war. And so I think it's important to remember that there are cases in America right now where the folks who brought in this partisan philosophy of the most extreme elements of the Republican Party, the Tea Party crowd, are actually carrying those policies out. You know, I mean, if you're a woman, I mean, as the father of two daughters, one of which was lucky enough to go to Brown, you know, I didn't think you'd see the restrictions on the most personal health care choice that a woman can make that you've seen come out of the states since 2010. I mean, this is not job creation. This isn't balancing budgets. You know, so they've gotten a little distracted by the radical social agenda that the same folks got in opponent Congress, and I don't think we should miss that point when we talk about some of the Republican governors who are doing the stuff they're doing in these states that has nothing to do with job growth, nothing to do with economic development, has more to do with carrying out the Tea Party uh, uh, marching orders. Thank you, Governor Trump. We're going to leave I'll Governor Schaefer. I would also like to add uh, to the question that we can't underestimate uh, how deep this recession affected people. And you yeah. talk about conflict and the stress they're under in their lives and uh, the, the, the inability to find work. And, uh, and that led to a lot of anger. And so some politicians were successful at tapping into that. I saw in, here in Rhode Island just issues you think you'd have thoughtful conversations around giving in-state tuition to undocumented students. You have, uh, you think that makes sense. You want your, the students to hear, yes, let them go to Rhode Island mm -hmm. College or URI or CCRI for in-state. If they can't pay in-state, they're not going to go. They're not going to graduate from college. But we had huge crowds come out angry about this, I thought was a good idea. Uh, certainly, uh, marriage equality was another brought out. Uh, people are under a lot of stress in their lives, right? This recession was terrible. And uh, that factored into uh, the question about the conflict. I think we're coming out of it. I hope we're coming out of it. A little more thoughtful debate on some of these important issues. Uh, I, I'm feeling good about the future as we come out of this terrible recession. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have time for one more question. But the good news is if you have a question that you would like to um, have answered by the governors, if you want to email me, wendyshiller at brown.edu, I will forward all the questions that you have to the governors, and then we can get you responses to questions that we can't, uh, we don't have time to hear today. So um, would you like to be our Thank last you. question? Our good morning. Question? I hope this isn't too much of a variant, but uh, all of you are governors of small states. Three of you are governors of states in New England, which, as a political science major at Brown, if I can say, has a political culture of town meeting, particularly two of your states. Do you think that that has helped you more than some of the other states, and particularly the larger states, in achieving what you have achieved, or helping you achieve what you want to achieve, uh, with bipartisanship? Excellent question. Thank yeah, you so that's much. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'd say yes. I mean, part of the reason we have 400 House members in New Hampshire for 1.3 million people is that town meeting culture. As we came out of colonial rule, we were determined not to let any of our 234 towns go unrepresented. Um, because the, the royal governor used to dismiss town representatives he didn't like. Um, and, so, and the town meeting culture also means that we are used to arguing with each other but then coming to agreement, and we know each other. And we know ultimately that we do care about the same things, about a strong economy and a strong middle class and a sustainable environment and a high quality of life and public safety. And we know we want our children's future to be better than our lives were. And when you have that sense of common purpose and common vision and you trust each other at a fundamental level, 
in a democracy as citizens, I think it is easier to move forward and trust each other enough to make difficult decisions together and to know that you might have to correct them later. So I, I do think it helps a great deal. Um, and the civic engagement that is New Hampshire's hallmark, it is really our culture, um, and also fueled by the first in the nation primary, uh, really does make that possible. I also think it's why we saw Tea Party rule for a very quick two years that was then very quickly rejected. Governor Markell, do you want to come on? I think it's a great question. Uh, I agree with uh, Governor Hassan. I think it's a, actually a significant help. Uh, for one thing, I, I think it's more difficult for the uh, uh, opposition to caricature any of us uh, when we're out and about and running into people in the grocery store and at yeah. the gym and every place else. And I, th and some, and I don't know how it is for my colleagues here, but I mean, I, uh, some of our colleagues will go eight years without ever driving a car. Yeah. They will not go anywhere without a state trooper with them. And uh, so, you know, I know we were talking earlier, we're out all the time, and I think it's important because people realize that you're real. And, 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 and beyond that, there's a very good chance that um, you and your opponent, you, you may have kids at the same school. Yeah. Or you shop at the same, and I know that happened in Rhode Island a few years ago. Yeah. Or you, um, same soccer or, team. Or, yeah, same soccer. <laughs> or you go, to the same, you go to the same store, and I think as a result, it, 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 you know, it doesn't make it perfect. I'm sure it's, it's not perfect in our state, and I'm sure it's not perfect any place else. But I think what it does allow us to do, including having lots of town hall meetings, is having people see that we're not be hiding behind a TV camera and doing all of our communication by TV, but the most effective communication is in a room just like this one or in much smaller ones. And I, I think it helps a lot in terms of allowing us to get a point across. I'm going to go to Governor Shumlin, and then the last word will be Governor Chafee. Um, I agree with everything that Maggie and, and Jack just said, and we just came out of town meeting in Vermont. The only thing I would add to that is it's not just town meeting government in small size. It's also about money. We got to talk about that. I mean, uh, in Vermont, uh, you can get elected to the legislature or to the Senate, uh, you know, on 2,000 bucks. So then you get paid 650 bucks a week, no health care, no benefits. So people are there because they believe in the state, not because they're on the take or because they think they're going to make a living doing this. So my point is, if you think back to the founding fathers and democracy, going back to your political science courses here at Brown, uh, democracy was not designed, I hate to say it, for Citizens United, for corporations being able to give unlimited money without being tagged, number one. And, and number two, it wasn't really designed, as Jack just mentioned, for 30 second sound bites. It was actually supposed to be a dialogue and a conversation and someone that you believed in and you knew personally. So I think that small states are the laboratory for change because not only of our democratic town meeting forms of government, but because we aren't bought by corporate interests that have so much influence on our democracy today. Thank you. Governor Chaffee, would you like to close out our yeah, discussion? Yeah, I wish we had a, a big state governor here to answer the, the other side yeah. of the question, because we are from the, the retail politics states here. Yeah. Uh, I can remember uh, pulling up to a gas station to fill up my car in the middle of a campaign. My opponent was filling up his car on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, Bob, hey, Link. <laughs> Go put the brass knuckles on after that a little bit. You got an extra coupon. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what we have here in Delaware and Vermont and New Hampshire and Rhode Island. I don't know if we had a governor of uh, Texas or got to get a brown grad from Texas, I guess. We have a few of those, actually. Yeah. So Governor we, Cuomo's a dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Yeah, Governor Cuomo's Well, thank you so much to Governor Chafee, Governor Hassan, Governor Markell, and Governor Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me add my thanks uh, to all of you, terrific panel. Uh, we will reconvene in 15 minutes for Tom Perez's keynote. Thank you. Great to see Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank terrific. You, you guys are terrific. Thank you. I took lots of notes for my lectures in Intro American. Hey, thank you. Keep that conversation going. Keep this under control.